Hello, and welcome back to Grim and Whim. I want to do a quick sort of housekeeping item um, because I'm sure some people have noticed that I haven't been producing a lot of videos where I'm in the video, and a lot of that has to do with time. I am in a very busy season currently as a teacher and then also as just a person living in the world. Um, to be honest, it takes a lot more time and effort for me to film myself and make sure the visual is good and the audio is good and then also doing the editing. Whereas when I just record audio, I have, you know, a few less things I have to worry about. And so because I'm in a busy time, but I do want to continue posting videos on Sundays, I am sort of taking a step back from filming myself. And so I hope that everyone will understand that it's just sort of how it has to be for right now. I'm not saying, you know, forever, but currently it's just what's working for my life. And I definitely don't want to ever feel like making YouTube videos is a chore. And right now it's not feeling that way because I'm able to work it into my schedule. However, it does become more of a chore when I include myself on the camera. And so this is sort of the direction I'm going in for right now. Like I said, I don't know if it'll be forever, but it's just what's working for me. And so hopefully everyone will be cool with that. And I'm also very excited going into 2024. I have a ton of topics that I'm excited to dive into this year. And so to produce content, I think having me step away from being on camera is just what's going to make it easier and more efficient to get videos to you all faster and also won't be damaging to my own mental health. And like I said um, before, it's really just a matter of time. I, I'm always kind of running out of time, it seems. And I just want to make sure that I'm still able to produce content in a timely manner. And so with all that being said, let's go ahead and dive into today's episode. On today's episode, we will be discussing topics such as human remains and death. So if you aren't in the headspace for that today, please be kind to your mind and I'll see you in the next one. Today we will be looking at the unsolved murder case of Carrie Patterson, a 15-year-old California girl who was tragically murdered in the year 1980. Her remains were found in Tonner Canyon, which is about 10 miles from where Carrie was last seen. Now decades have passed, and this case has still stumped investigators because while her remains were found, her killer still has not. So let's dive into this mystery that is Carrie Patterson and the theories surrounding her untimely and bizarre death. Carrie Louise Patterson was born on September 11, 1964. Carrie was a young white girl with um, blonde hair, brown eyes. Um, she stood about five foot two inches and around 105 pounds, and she had these big dimples on her cheeks when she smiled. Her look and sense of style was very much that sort of laid back surfer girl and very much that California girl look that was very popular in the late 70s, early 80s. And Carrie was described as sort of being that typical California girl. She was cool and popular and athletic and beautiful. And she seemed to just make friends wherever she went. She apparently loved softball, and she played on her school's team. While researching the case, I spent a lot of time trying to research her family, but 
there really isn't a lot of information out there. And I'm not sure if the family requested, you know, discretion from the investigators and the media, you know, or what, but I really couldn't find the name of Carrie's father or any of her siblings except for one of her sisters named Michelle Patterson. And Michelle does come into the case later on. And so that's a name to remember. But as far as the other members of her family, for whatever reason, I just could not find a lot of information. What we do know is that the Patterson family had recently moved from Cerritos, California to Fullerton, California in the summer of 1980. And this move was hard for Carrie. And, you know, you can kind of imagine why. I mean, she's in high school and she's very well established at her high school. Like I said, she was on the softball team at her high school and she also had lots of friends. And so I can completely understand why moving would be difficult, um, especially as a teenager and having to leave behind her friends and her team. And the move also meant starting over in a new school in the fall. But despite this, life back in Cerritos, California, wasn't exactly ideal either. Like I said, Carrie was a popular girl, which meant plenty of interest from the boys and plenty of jealousy from the other girls. And apparently this jealousy was turning into threats of violence against Carrie. And according to Carrie's sister, Michelle, you know, Carrie was very pretty. You know, she had lots of boyfriends and she got harassed by a lot of the girls and was even getting into fights. And apparently someone, uh, one of the girls even ripped a gold necklace you know, right off of her neck. And so because all of this, you know, bullying that's happening, Carrie's mother, Crystal, insisted that the entire family just move and relocate to Fullerton, California, just to kind of get away from the drama. So now it's, you know, the summer of 1980, and the Patterson family has relocated to the 1700 block of Peacock Lane in the city of Fullerton, California. And it was a normal day on June 26, 1980, when Carrie asked her mother about taking a bus to Huntington Beach with her sister to meet up with some friends. But her mother asked her to stay home until the moving truck arrived and unloaded. And so basically her mom said, no, you can't go out with your sister, you know, and meet up with these friends. You know, you have obligations here. And basically Carrie decided to ignore her mom. And she left anyway around 1 p.m., leaving her sister Michelle at home to look out for the moving truck. So basically, the plan was to meet up with some friends, um, Daniel or Danny Wozab, who there is some speculation that either he liked Carrie or perhaps Carrie liked him, but we'll get into that later. It's all sort of speculative, and so I don't want to get too far into that right now, but Danny Wozab was one of the guys she was going to meet. Then there was Michael Cruz and then Troy LeClear. And the plan was to meet up at an ice cream parlor called the Ice Cream Castle. And Carrie later told her friends that she was going to go ahead and head home because the shoes that she was wearing were dirty and she wanted to go home and wash her shoes. And she also told the guys that she might go and visit the local horse stables after. So Danny dropped her off at the corner of 
Parks Road and Peacock Lane around 4 p.m., which is like a stone's throw away from Carrie's house. These friends are hanging out, you know, they ride home on bicycles, and Carrie is, you know, supposed to walk home, you know, from this corner where everyone can see her house. And yet, somehow, Carrie is never seen again, and she doesn't make it home. And on the day that she disappeared, she was wearing a red Hawaiian print blouse, light blue loose-fitting pants, and white vans. And she was also carrying a white uh, macrame purse. And like I said, she was walking home um, after being dropped off by her friend, and it was a short walk. And so that's sort of where the disappearance part of this case happens. So at this point, she is just a missing person. They haven't, you know, found any um, remains or you know, reasons to believe that Carrie is no longer alive. And so the police initially believed that Carrie had just run away from home, that maybe the guys had, you know, dropped her off and maybe she went to meet up with a boy or maybe she, you know, decided to go off on some other adventure or just plane run away. But her family were insistent that this is completely outside of Carrie's personality, and she would not just run away from home. Now, she did sneak out of the house, but that was to meet up with friends, and she had every intention of doing things at her house after. Like I said, she was planning on cleaning those white vans that got dirty, and then she was also planning on going to the stables to see horses. And so the running away idea doesn't really hold up. Not to mention Michelle, the younger sister, she would have been tipped off if Carrie was trying to run away from home. She would have likely taken important belongings with her. And like I said before, this behavior was just not consistent with Carrie's personality. Like, yes, you know, the family moved and, you know, she may have felt, you know, some type of way about that. But Carrie was a really popular girl and just this really charismatic, friendly type of person. And so she was going to make more friends. The idea of her running away really doesn't make a lot of sense. But because it is the 80s, police kind of you know, saw that she was a 15-year-old and just kind of wrote it off as, oh, she ran away. Early on in the investigation, there were some inconsistencies in the testimony made by Carrie's friends that she had seen that day, which made it difficult to get a good idea of what happened that day, as well as understanding the timeline of events. According to Danny Wozab, after going to the ice cream castle, Carrie climbed onto the handlebars of his bike, and then he and the rest of the guys escorted her home on their bicycles. And the boys, like I said, they dropped her off at this corner where, you know, they saw her walking towards her house. Her house was visible. And then the boys claim that after they dropped off Carrie, she walked home, and that was the last time that they ever saw her again. The investigation was also hampered by a lack of thorough searches in the surrounding areas, and this could have been on the police officer's end, you know, the investigative team's end, you know, thinking that oh, this is just a runaway, you know, she'll turn up. It's not in entirely clear why they didn't do thorough searches, but six months later, after Carrie 
was last seen alive. There was finally a break in the case. On December 27, 1980, a union oil worker found a skull with some remaining teeth, a left femur, and a left tibia in a field near Tonner Canyon, and this was behind the Bria Mall, which is kind of a bigger landmark in this area. The remains were collected by investigators, and like I said, the skull did have some teeth left behind, and through dental records, they were able to determine that these remains belonged to Carrie Louise Patterson. The discovery that Carrie was no longer alive sent shockwaves through the community, and her family, of course, was devastated because they were holding out hope that maybe, you know, she had just been, you know, taken but was still alive, or maybe she had run away and decided to come home, or, you know, maybe she decided, you know, to go off on a little adventure, but, you know, they didn't expect that Carrie would have been murdered. And in this area in, you know, Fullerton, California, especially in the 80s, things like this didn't happen to their community. It was, you know, considered a safer community. And so everyone was just devastated. And following the discovery of her remains, an anthropologist at Fullerton State University named Judy Suche, um, they actually examined the bones and uh, this anthropologist determined that they had been in the canyon for about six months all the way up to two years. And so... Carrie had been missing for six months and one day at that point. So it's likely that her death came soon or immediately after she was reported missing. Carrie Louise Patterson was laid to rest in March of 1981 at a ceremony full of flowers and music that Carrie would have loved. Family and friends gathered to remember the girl who was so full of light and life. And the aftermath of her murder prompted parents in the community to be more cautious and protective over their children, specifically their teenagers. And it raised more awareness about how vulnerable teenagers can be and how important it is to have, you know, open communication between parents and children. And like I said, this case does take place in the 1980s. And so it is difficult when, you know, teenagers at this time don't have cell phones, you know, an easy way to you know, text or call a parent or a family member and let them know, hey, I'm running a few minutes late, but I'm heading home. You know, things like that makes it a lot more difficult. And also, it was a little bit more abnormal and strange, like I said, for a person to go missing and be later found deceased in this community. And so, the parents and um, the rest of the community were really trying to raise awareness so that nothing like this would ever happen again. And for years after Carrie had passed away, the community members actually organized vigils and memorial services to remember Carrie and support her family in their quest of justice, but also to remind the community that this could happen to anyone. And so be aware of where your children are, even if it is, you know, the summer and, you know, they are just hanging out with friends, things like that. It could happen to anyone. 
As of right now, no one has been officially charged in her disappearance or her death, and the teenagers that Carrie met up with that day have never been labeled as suspects, but they were the last people to see her alive. Danny may have felt protective of her, and that's why he dropped her off so close to her house, um, because apparently Carrie had been telling Danny that there was this creep that had been following her. However, nothing has come from this, and this creep has never been identified. It's just a big question mark. The testimony from the three teens appeared very unclear in the press reports, but the investigators believe that this was likely due to poor reporting on the media's end rather than anything more you know, suspicious. Robert Taft, the current cold case investigator with the Orange County Sheriff's Department, he claims that only using, you know, bicycles, you know, Danny Wozab's bicycle where, um, you know, the boys say that they took Carrie home and Carrie was just like, you know, riding on Danny's bike, you know, using the handlebars. Using bicycles to kidnap someone would be virtually impossible. And so they really don't have any reason to believe that the teens are involved. And the teenagers have been very cooperative with the investigation. Now, these teenagers, I keep saying teenagers because at the time they were teenagers, but now, you know, of course, they're well into adulthood and they are still active with the Orange County Police Department in, you know, helping them understand what could have possibly happened to Carrie. And they even have gone as far as rewalking the bike route home that they took. And so, like I said, these teenagers, you know, these people who were teenagers at the time, they have been very cooperative and they have never been labeled as suspects in the case. However, they were the last people to see her alive. And so we do have to sort of keep them on our radar. However, they really aren't being seriously looked at as suspects at this time. Carrie's family was also interviewed, as well as an unnamed boyfriend. And whether or not this boyfriend was one of the boys that she met up with is sort of uncertain, but we do know that it wasn't Danny Wozab, and her family actually had no idea that she even had a boyfriend. And this is including her sister, Michelle, who she was very close with. And so the whole boyfriend thing is sort of confusing. It's not really sure if she had a boyfriend. There are some people who, you know, speculated that Carrie liked Danny and Danny liked Carrie. But like I said, a lot of that is hearsay and can't actually be proven. So I don't want to spend too much time about, you know, Carrie's potential relationships. But with all that being said, let's go ahead and get into the theories and what the investigative team is sort of looking at as far as what could have happened to Carrie that day. So like I said before, pretty much everyone who has looked at this case has completely thrown away the possibility that Carrie, you know, ran away from home. And like I said, it makes really no sense for her to run away from home. She had just hung out with friends. She had made plans. And then also she didn't really take anything with her to run away. And so, you know, the family, friends, the investigative team, nobody really thinks that that's a possibility. However, her being kidnapped is definitely up there as a possibility. And a kidnapping on Peacock Lane 
um, it would have been unlikely for someone to have taken her against her will just because in that neighborhood, there wasn't any, you know, disturbance noted. And if someone tried to grab her, you know, she likely would have screamed. And also, this was, you know, in June, around 4 p.m. ish. And so, obviously, it's not dark out. And so, for someone to have just grabbed her and like threw her in, you know, a van or something, it's possible. However, most people think that it's more likely that Carrie may have accepted a ride from someone. The reason why that makes more sense is because, like I said, since it was so bright out and she was in a residential area, her being kidnapped, well, isn't completely out of the realm of possibility and, you know, it can't be ruled out, it would have been a little bit more difficult to kidnap someone like Carrie being that she was a very healthy, athletic girl, and I don't think she would have been taken without a fight, if that makes sense. And so it's not ruled out, but a lot of people think that if she was kidnapped, it's more likely that she accepted a ride from someone and then something went wrong. The other theory that people have sort of gone back and forth with is whether or not maybe Carrie was planning on meeting up with a boy. So like I said before, Carrie, her remains were found in Tonner Canyon. And apparently locals of this area know this to be a sort of lover's lane. And so with her remains being found there, some people have wondered if maybe Carrie left voluntarily with someone to meet up with a boy. And it could have been someone that was with her that night, you know, either Danny Wozab or one of the other two um, boys that were with her. Or it could be this unnamed boyfriend that she apparently had. Or there's a possibility that this creep that Carrie was telling Danny about, maybe he picked her up, somehow convinced her to get in the car with him and go up to this lover's lane. Maybe he sweet-talked her or something. And once they got there, it's possible that maybe he was, you know, hitting on her and maybe she wasn't really feeling it. And something happened where foul play occurred. And that's why Carrie's remains were found there, because maybe she was murdered in Tonner Canyon. It's a possibility. Like I said, what makes it tricky is that we don't know the name of the boyfriend or if the boyfriend even exists. We don't know the name of this creep. And then the guys on the bicycles, you know, to get up to Tanya Cannon, you wouldn't be able to do it from where they lived on bicycle, um, especially if they're also with Carrie, who isn't on a bicycle. She's on one of their bicycles, you know, like riding along. It just, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it is a possibility. And so her voluntarily going to meet a boy, it's one of the theories, but we don't 100% know how she would have gotten there and also who this person that she was meeting, who they are. We don't know any idea of who they are. Another possibility is that Carrie was hit by a car while she was walking home from her outing with her three guy friends. And 
perhaps she was hit by the car, the driver panicked and, you know, threw her in the car, drove her up to, you know, Tonner Canyon and buried her there. However, the remains that were found, they did not show any signs of impact from a car. So it is possible, but the remains that they do have, they don't show that type of injury. Finally, there is the likelihood that maybe Carrie was met with foul play by a serial killer. And the fact that Carrie's remains were found above ground and weren't buried suggests that maybe her killer didn't really have any fear that he or she were to be discovered. And well, in most cases, most murders are, you know, done by people who know the victim at some kind of capacity, whether it's a family member or a friend or even just somebody that they know they're in passing with, like this potential creep that, you know, Carrie had told Danny about. It is more likely that a victim, their murderer, is someone that is in their life in some way. That doesn't necessarily rule out a serial killer. And while they are more rare, it's a possibility. And it could very well be that some serial killer took advantage of the fact that this girl was walking home by herself. And yes, you know, she was close to her home, but, you know, she is still walking. Maybe they took advantage of the fact that she was walking home alone and possibly you know, lured her into a different location or into a car. You know, there's a lot of possibilities. And the problem with this case is that because there is such little evidence and because the case was sort of hampered at the beginning due to lack of thorough searches, we kind of have a lot to speculate on. And that makes it really difficult to sort of narrow down a primary theory. It's just there's a lot up in the air. And that makes this case very interesting. It also makes it very frustrating. And I'm sure for the family members and the community, it's devastating that this girl and her family really haven't had justice because there is such a wide range of what-ifs due to lack of evidence. There is one sort of glimmer of hope in this case um, because someone did come forward to the investigative team and they gave some information about a man they believed was in the area when Carrie was last seen. And they were able to give a description of this person, and this led to a composite sketch. And I'm going to show the sketch so that way, if, you know, anyone recognizes this person, maybe they can come forward and hopefully it will generate more leads for the investigative team because like i said there really aren't a lot of leads to go off of and so if you happen to recognize the person that is in this composite sketch or if you have any other helpful information um, the investigative team is begging the public to either um, submit a tip. Um, you can submit a tip to the Orange County Crime Stoppers um, at 855 TIP OCCS. You can also get a hold of the lead investigator, Robert Taft, at 714 647 7045. 
And he also has an email, and I will put all this information in the description below, but you can also reach out via email at coldcase at ocsheriff.gov. Tonight, detectives are hoping the public will help them solve a case that has turned cold. The Orange County Sheriff's Department released a sketch of a person of interest. It was created after someone came forward with a description. 15-year-old Carrie Patterson was last seen in June of 1980. She was walking near Parks Junior High School in Fullerton, we're told. She never made it home. Her body was found six months later in Brea, dumped in a field near Tonner Canyon and the 57 Freeway. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Orange County Sheriff's Department or OC Crime Stoppers. So hopefully with more exposure to Carrie's case and with this composite sketch, even though we don't have, like I said, a name of this person, um, having a sketch could at least maybe jog someone's memory and maybe just maybe we will actually have some answers to this case. It is crazy that so many decades have passed and we still don't have really any more leads to finding justice for Carrie. And so, like I said, if you have any information, go ahead and submit it to the right people. And all that information will be in the description box. And I really, truly hope for Carrie's sake and for her family and friends and the community that loved her and just saw this beautiful light get unnecessarily and so cruelly just stomped out from the world. They deserve justice. Carrie deserves justice. And so do what you can. And share this video, um, share this podcast. Hopefully it'll reach the right people and we'll have justice one day. Thank you so much for joining me. It's goodbye for now, but I hope to haunt you again soon.